Let me ask you something. Hi, Eric. Hi, Jenny. You're going to have a kid? That's good. Hi, Joe. Hi, Blanca. You have a kid. That's good. Once your kids grow up, what would you like your child to do for you? Let's say you have a really great relationship with your parents. Hey, how about you? Especially a lot of you are young. If you were able to do, if you had the luxury of resources to do something for your mom and dad, what would you like to do? I remember having, I think I remember that this conversation. If it was my, my daughter, it was somebody else's kid. And, oh, I remember this. I remember Elias. Um, Elias and Elias and uh, and Deacon David back there, they were talking, and they were talking about how many rings certain uh, certain sports stars have, right? Uh, and then Elias looks over at his dad because he's into basketball right now. He goes, "I'll get you a ring. <laughs> I'll get you a championship ring. Cool, cool. If you have the resources, what would you want to do for your mom or for your dad? How about a house?" How about a house, right? And while you're at it, a big house where you all could live, right? That would be great. Okay, maybe a series of townhomes where you're close enough, but there's a little bit of distance. Be real, right? But <laughs> you want a house for your parents? I think that's a great, great ambition. May the Lord grant you that kind of um, capacity for generosity as I like to pray. King David, King David, who was the greatest king of the nation of Israel, he had a relationship to God that was unparalleled. I mean, he loved God. He loved Him with all his heart. Read in the Psalms, and the Psalms just overflow with devotion and longing for greater devotion, greater love, a celebration of the relationship that David had with the Heavenly Father, with God. And God, it wasn't just one way, it was reciprocated. God loved David, no matter how many times he failed, no matter how many times he fell, God loved him, restored him, and cared for him, and was with him. He gave promises to him, and kept those promises too. David was like a son, he was a son to God. And so David, he's living in a big house, and at the time, the throne of God was inside of a tent, and David is thinking, I want to build my God a house. So he said, he said to a prophet, he said to his prophet, I want to build a house for God. The prophet initially said, yeah, go ahead. God is with you in everything that he does. It's obvious. But then later on, God, he spoke to his prophet and said, no, 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 David, you don't need to build me a house. I understand your heart. I like it, but you will not build me a house. I will build you a house. Isn't that just like God? He says, I want to build you a house. David says, I want to make you a house. God says, no, 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 let me build you a house. And the house that God is talking about, not brick and mortar, not this kind of a building, but God is saying, I will build your dynasty. I will give you a son. I will give you a son who will be king, not just for his lifetime, but forever. And he will exercise kingship over all of the nations. And he will be a majestic son whose reign will last forever. And your son will build me a house. That's what God said. So, David had a son. His name was Solomon. David's son, Solomon built the house of God. So in a way, that was a fulfillment of God's promise, wasn't it? That he would allow, he would allow David's son to build a house. And it was a beautiful house. It was a, it was a gorgeous house. They spent years building the house. And they, they, they did it in such a meticulous manner. They said that not even a hammer was heard inside the building. We talk about technology today, and technology is just exploding. But they had some kind of fantastic technology back then as well. And they used it. They used it to honor God, to glorify Him, and they built this beautiful house where if anybody visited Jerusalem, they would see, wow, God is here. This is a house truly fit for the creator of the universe. This is the house of God. So Solomon built this house, the son of David. Problem, 
Solomon ended up messing up very badly. Later on, what did he do? He ended up worshiping other gods. He ended up in a very, 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 very bad place. How did he get there? The Bible says that his wife, his wife, his wives, his wives turned his heart away. The women in his life turned his heart away. King Solomon said these words. He said, a person who gets a wife from the Lord gets blessing. He took his own advice too seriously and twisted it. He got himself, listen, 1,000 wives. A what? 1,000 wives. 300, 300 proper wives, 700 concubines. And as I mentioned that, I'm afraid that's the only thing you remember from the sermon. That's the, this is a sermon. Pastor Paul talked about a guy having 1,000 wives. Okay, there it is. Done. But his wives turned his heart away from God. His name means loved by God. And then instead of loving God, he loved all of these other gods, all of these other idols. He allowed his heart, he allowed his mind to stray in every which way, in every direction. He did not withhold himself from any pleasure that was existing in that day. By God's grace, I think King Solomon repented. The book of Ecclesiastes, most likely written by him, shows his repentance as he turned and as he came back. So King Solomon was not the son whose reign would last forever. Neither was the temple that he built, the temple that would exist forever, the house of God. Because a lot later on, what happened was the Babylonians came and leveled it. And the house was gone. The house was gone. The house of God, no more. But what's fascinating is, when Jesus appears on the scene, you know what Jesus is, Jesus is called, his title? He's called the son of David. And if you trace his genealogy back from his father Joseph or his mother Mary, his father Joseph, the book of Matthew, his, his mother Mary, the book of Luke, they all trace back to who? Guess! King, not Solomon. Okay, I'm not sure. I didn't... I, I'm, I, I checked it out before. I didn't check it out for this sermon, so I'm not sure if it was Solomon. But I think it is. Anyway, it goes back <laughs> to David, okay? So he is the son of David. Jesus is. Everybody calls him the son of David because he is the long way to Messiah. They're expecting him to be the king whose reign will last forever. Not only this, there, Jesus gets into this talk about the building, about the temple of God. And with these Pharisees, he has this conversation. And he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they were confused. They're saying it took so long to build this building. You're going to raise it up in three days? Really? I would love to see you try. And so they didn't really get it. But this is the explanation. You know what he was talking about? Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. So Jesus is not only the long-awaited son of David, but he is himself the temple of God. His body houses the presence of God. Can you stay with me for just a little bit? If we go back even further, all right, Moses originally built the tent where God's throne was. Okay? He designed it by directions given by God when he spent time on a mountain. But the Bible says, the Bible does not say God gave him these words of what the dimensions of the, of the temple or the tent is supposed to be. He says he saw it. He saw the design and went down and made the tent. Do you hear me? He saw something on the mountain and made a replica on earth. The temple is patterned after that same replica of the tent. So the temple too is patterned after something eternal in heaven. And if you look at it from the New Testament perspective of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, what Moses saw on the mountain was not just a what, but a who. He saw Jesus there. 
He saw Jesus there. And according to the glory of God that he saw in seeing Jesus on the mountain, he made the tent, which later on became the temple. And the temple was just a shadow, just a shadow, a pointer toward the real thing, the true one who is Jesus, the temple of God. Are you with me? Okay, kind of too much all of a sudden. We're in the afternoon. We're not morning anymore, right? So we should be awake by this time, yes? All right, are you with me? Okay, here we go. Let me give you... <laughs> I think I lost like half of you. I've got most of you. I've got the other, other half. Hoping for a majority. But just in case, let me give you a recap. Okay. Oh, what is this? Oh, okay. Okay, I gotta go one step further. And this is this. That because of Jesus, what Jesus has done, believe it or not, what has happened is, not only is Jesus the temple of God, we are now called Jesus' body, the temple of God. That the church is the temple of God. When the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, He invaded our hearts, He invaded our community, and He established the kingdom of God on earth. We house the temple. We house the Holy Spirit of God. He lives among us. He lives within us. And so we are the temple, the true temple of God. Look at it. I'm not making this up. Do you not know that y'all are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in y'all. Back to Paul, my Bible don't read like that. Why did you do that? Okay, we're not we're in the West Coast. We're not East Coast or, or anywhere else. We're not, the, we're not the Midwest. We don't use the word y'all. But that's the correct literal translation. Your Bible says you, but that's a plural in the Greek. It's the church, y'all. Okay. It's the church. It's all of us. We are now the body of Jesus, the true temple of God, in which the Holy Spirit of God is delighted to dwell. Do you know who you are? Hey, now recap. Okay, now recap. Here we go. Here we go. If you didn't get it so far, it's okay because we're gonna do it again, really quick. All right. This is the house of God. David. David wanted to build the house of God. But David was not allowed to do it, partly because he spilled God's blood and God had another plan, okay? So David was not it. David's son would do it, King Solomon. And so King Solomon built this majestic temple, but Solomon messed up pretty badly, and Solomon showed that he too was not the fulfillment of the true son of David. He was also disqualified, and that temple was destroyed in the time of the invasion of the Babylonians, okay? So that temple could not be the everlasting temple representing the presence of God among us. And so what we find out is that Jesus himself is the temple of God. He has always been the temple of God, the perfect representation of God the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you meet Jesus, you meet God. And when Jesus is there, God is there. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you receive God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they come. He comes to live inside of your heart. He is the one living among us today. How did that happen? Through his cross. Through the crucifixion and the resurrection, Jesus rises again from the dead, goes to heaven, sends his spirit. He himself and the Heavenly Father come in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father and the Son. And the triune God comes to live inside of the house. Okay? <laughs> inside our fellowship, God condescends and stoops to live among us and now we as the church of God are the temple of God. I know the house is just a local church. I understand that. But what we represent, what we are a part of, and just in as a local expression, we are the body of Jesus that God has planted in the city of Los Angeles to be his presence and to shine his light. Okay? The reason why we are on this today, not just because the house is a favorite subject of mine, but because this is a part of the curriculum that you all are going through. One of you said to me, Pastor Paul, really, I love the providential way that your sermons line up with our Lord's Day School curriculum. 
This time it was fully on purpose. I, I planned it. Because next week is supposed to be, I hope we're on the same page, the, uh, the temple. Unless I read the curriculum wrong. Are we good? David, are we good? All right. Okay, good, good, good. And in the curriculum, we are told that the temple has these, four, these three functions. The majesty, the mercy, and the mission. That the temple has these three M's to it. I put my words on there, but this is, this is exactly what your curriculum teaches. That the temple has these aspects. Go with, go, go with me one more time. Here we go. Everybody together. Go ahead. Majesty, mercy, and mission. The temple is about the majesty of God. The temple is about the mercy of God and the mission of God. Okay? The majesty, the mercy, and the mission. So what I would propose to do right now is to take each one of these and see how they are fulfilled in, in the temple and in Jesus and then in us. In the temple, in Jesus, and in us. Temple and Jesus and us. So we're going to go through that like that. And you'll see, now you don't even have to look at your sermon overview sheets to, get, to see when I'm going to be ending because we'll be following that pattern all the way throughout. Are we good? Let's look then at the majesty of God displayed here. Majesty of God displayed here in Acts and in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 through 11. And when the priests came out of the holy place, this is after the, they placed the throne of God inside the temple, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, where the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The glory of the Lord, the glory, the heavy presence of God filled this house in such a way that the holiest people of Israel, the priests, could not stand to serve in there. They could not minister inside the temple because the glory of God filled that temple. It was too awesome for them to stay in. We are drawn toward the glory of God, but His holiness repels us because we are not holy. And that's the condition that we see in the first temple. When the holy presence of God invades that temple, people have to run. People have to run away. Jesus comes, and when he comes, he is filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He is already the temple of God at conception. And when he walks among his people, he is God among his people. And John would later write that we saw, we touched, we felt, we walked with him, we, we ate with him. And when we encounter him now, we encounter the very presence of God. Jesus is the presence of God. Jesus brings the presence of God when he sends the Holy Spirit into his church. The Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, establishes establishes his presence among us, invades our hearts, and the presence of God is here in the church today. Do you see that? And unlike the first temple, for us, the Holy Spirit does not expel us. He does not push us out. The holy presence of God draws us in. He's pulling people in now. That's what his presence does. And and, 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 and the priest here, it says that the holy presence of God would not allow them to serve in the temple. But what does the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, do for us now? He equips you. He holifies, he sanctifies your talents to be used for his body. He sanctifies your intellect. He sanctifies your singing. He sanctifies your service for the glory of His beautiful name in His church. So it's like like the opposite way. He doesn't push us out. He draws us in. And we don't become useless. We become useful in His hand. That's where you and I live today. This is the church. The very place of the presence of God. Loved ones. Wherever you transition, let me just say this word to you. Don't transition away from the Lord. Let none of you ever graduate from church. Okay? I speak to people who consider themselves very holy. And when you talk to them, they seem like they love the Lord. But they're really just walking away from the Lord and walking away from the church. They tell me that there are too many hypocrites in the church. And they tell me that they have been hurt too badly in the church but do you avoid the hospital because there are too many sick people in it 
The church is where the presence of God is. The church is where true life is. And if you don't have a church home today, I want to open our doors to you to join us as your church home. Or go find a place where you can really call it home. You know, the saying is this, if you say that you don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites, and you find the perfect church, what do they say? Don't go in, right? Because once you do, it will no longer be perfect. It will also be filled with a hypocrite as well, right? So that's true as well. I'm sorry, I had to kind of throw that in. It was just in my head, and kind of bouncing around in there. But at the end of the day, the church is where God pours out his blessing. So I want to encourage you, come back home. Come back home to the church of God. I know some of you long to worship. You're just not able. Circumstances don't allow it. Physically, you're just hurting too much. I just mentioned somebody like that today. Yeah, I know. But continue to long. Continue to pray. And by God's grace, he'll open doors. And we'll be able to worship together. Come home. The presence of God. Do you know the presence of God? Have you experienced the presence of God? When you worship, do you experience, do you know the presence of God? And many of us will testify and say, Amen, Pastor Paul. When we worship together, when we sing together, when I listen to the sermons, I hear God speak to my heart. My heart is moved. My life is changed. I cannot help but respond. Yes, praise God. That's the way it should be. And for some of you, it's not like that. And I'm praying that it will be like that. That you would be able to worship God. You would be confronted by Him. Not only in your intellect, but also in your feeling, as well as in your acting, in your life. I pray, if it's your heart issue, somebody once said to me, Pastor Paul, I just want to feel something. I want to say to him, what you want to feel is not something, but someone. You need to be confronted by Him. And yes, He deserves worship with your heart as well as your head. Give Him everything and meet with Him. And I'm praying for you that God will speak to you, speak to your mind, speak to your heart, speak to your hands, speak to your homes. And where will that happen? The God-ordained place is the church. So I'm praying for you. If some of you are going through a particularly dry spell right now and you know you need the presence of God, no matter what that was, and no matter what that was, whether it's because you've been sinning a lot or whether it's because you just have too many questions about Christianity, whatever it is, I pray that you would meet with Jesus and all those other things will become a less of a nuisance. If you, if you have a lot of questions about Christianity, please come talk to me. I would love to talk to you. Nobody sends me any questions. Okay, some people do. But almost nobody does. I, yeah, I, you can call me lonely and a, and a loser. That's okay. I don't mind. You can send me pity questions. That's fine as well. Just kidding about that, okay? But I love answering questions. But at the end of the day, if all your answers, questions were answered, would you trust in Jesus? Would you commit your life to Him? At the end of the day, what you need to do is bite. What you need to do is trust. If you know enough, throw yourself on Him, at Him, and you will find Him to be all that you need. Truly delicious. Remember last, the last week, we, I brought you that peach. Remember that? And I took a bite out of that peach, and it was dripping, it was so good, and I said I had an extra one in my bag. I would give it to anybody who asked for it. Right after the, uh, the message, David walked up to me. And he had something in his hand, something in his mouth. And he said, man, you weren't lying. And he had gotten to my peach and he was eating it. And so I was thinking, maybe he got to the one that was fresh. No, he ate the one I was eating. <laughs> and he was enjoying that. And that's good. That's good. But I bet David was not, once he had that bite in his mouth, he was not asking. Once I had that bite in my mouth, I was not asking and thinking, mm, I wonder which taste bud in my tongue is attaching to which sugar molecule and what exactly it is that it is producing this delicious peach taste. I did not ask any of those questions. I just enjoyed the peach. Once you meet Jesus, you'll still have your questions. 
but there won't be that big of an obstacle anymore. Once you're struck with his love and his mercy and his kindness, once you, by God's grace, allow yourself to give in to the beauty of Jesus, somebody said this, and I said I think it's, it's quite insightful. God may not necessarily have given you a watertight argument for Jesus. He did not give you a water. He may not have given you a watertight argument, but he gave you a watertight person. Isn't that good? That when you see the beauty of the person of Jesus, his mercy, his kindness, his patience, his power, his humility, you can't help but love him. And when you love him, the other obstacles are not that important. All right, spent too much time on the majestic presence of God. Hopefully these other two will be a little bit more quick. Mercy, the merciful faithfulness of God. Look at, these, look at what it, how it says it here in verse 30. Listen to the plea of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place and when you hear, forgive. The temple is all about the mercy of God. The very throne of God inside the temple is called the mercy seat. And when people, no matter how far away they strayed from God, when they look to the temple and they pray and they repent, King Solomon is saying, please, Hear from heaven and forgive, not just from your temple, but from heaven. Grant true forgiveness, grant true acceptance, grant absolute restoration. God, you can do this. I would not as a human being, but because you are God, you can and you will. You are a God of covenant faithfulness. And no matter how far we stray, when we repent, when we cry out, you will have mercy. You will have mercy on us. The whole sacrificial system of the temple points to God's mercy. Every aspect of it points to the covenant faithfulness of God. And that's what Jesus does. You see, they were told to pray toward the temple. Who do we pray toward now? Our temple, King Jesus. We pray toward Him. We pray in His name. And when we pray in His name, we know that our prayers are heard. Amen? That's what the Bible says. No matter how far you stray, how long you haven't been coming out to church, how often you've fallen back into patterns of sins this past week, you come to church and find mercy in your time of need. Pastor Paul, can't I not find mercy on my knees at home? Do that and do this too. Do that and do this too. Deal with it on your knees at home and come to church and cry out and pray. Because mercy is here. Mercy is here. We are all very terribly broken and sinful people. Can I get an amen? Every single one of us, no matter how mature you are in your spirituality, the more mature you get, the more dirty you realize you are, and the more amazed you become at His mercy and grace. God is truly amazing. So come. Come to church. I think about this scenario. Those of you who are couples, please listen to me more than likely well, on your way to church something will go wrong and you will have an argument in your car I know one person you know she he got in a really really just gut wrenching argument with his wife at, 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 on his way to church and I know a lot of people, what they do is, what, what do they do? When you get in an argument with your wife, and you're going on your way, to, way home, you're bickering back and forth, and, oh, forget it, I can't worship like this, and you turn the car around and go back home, right? I can't tell you. There have been at least a handful of times when people I know in this church have done that. Right? I know one person, he had gotten in such a heated argument with his wife that he was in no mood to worship. But he ended up going to church. Why? Because then who else is going to preach? Right? I mean, he had to go. He had to be there. But I think that's good. I think that's right. Even if you're not the pastor, loved one, when you are in a heated argument with the person that you love the most, that you're committed, committed to share the loving covenant faithfulness of God with, and you fight with that person, you need to be in church. You don't need to drive back home. Come to church and repent and worship. 
because this is where mercy is. And when we have the Lord's Supper, that's why I say, food is for the hungry. You've been in a lot of sin the past week. Confess it. His blood and his body is for sinful people like you and me. Isn't God just amazing? Isn't Jesus beautiful? Final point is this. Mission. Mission. It says this. Speaking about the temple. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all that he promised, not one word has failed in all his good promise which he spoke by Moses' servant. All the promises are being fulfilled. And looking at the temple, it was a reminder that God is faithful in spite of our faithlessness. That he will complete, he will fulfill his promises. And what is Jesus Jesus is on a mission to fulfill the promises of of God. To to fulfill God's mission. When God said, go and give your life for these people that we love, he said he would go. And he came and he did. He fulfilled the mission of God. And now he sends us on his mission to be his body, to be his presence, to be his mercy to all the people that to whom he sends us. We are his house. We are his temple. We are on mission. And so I want to challenge you and I want to call you loved one, church of God, temple of God. Be on mission where you are. You already are on mission. Fulfill your mission. Live it out. Glorify him where you are. Honor him in your home. Honor him in your workplace. Honor him in your school place. Go and represent. That's why the announcements say, hey, new school starting? Go represent. Represent. Be Jesus where you are. So many people, so many broken people need desperately to see the presence and the mercy of God. That's who you are called to be. Tim and Rebecca, looking forward to being married. Jenny and Eric, having a kid. Joe and Blanca, having had a kid. We got the whole spectrum going on here. My heart's desire and prayer is to see families intentionally centered on King Jesus. At the temple of God, we would see our church as the temple of God, but you would see your family also as a small unit of the temple of God, fully functioning and representing him to one another, feeding on the Jesus that you show each other, praying for one another, building into each other's lives, because you are on mission where you are. Not a single one of you is, is, is useless to the kingdom of God. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. Every single one of you is useful for others in the kingdom of God. There's a book in the back by John Piper. I encourage you, if you've never read it, you can have it. It's called Don't Waste Your Life. Probably, possibly second only to his famous book, Desiring God. That's the most famous book, most widely read. Probably more widely read than Desiring God. You know why? Because Desiring God is that thick and Don't Waste Your Life is that thick. Okay? So I want to encourage you. It's a very good, very easy read. And in that book, there is a story of a man in his 70s, I believe it was, who was at a revival meeting. And he came forward and trusted in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. This man has spent his entire 70 years of life without God and he met his Savior. Toward the end of his life, he met his Savior. He met him in a real way, a powerful way. He was blasted by God's grace. And when the whole session, the the, the message and the worship was over, he was still in the front, on his face, crying, weeping, weeping, crying. Evangelist came and walked up to him and tried to see what it was about, how he might be able to help. He listened carefully, and the man, what he's saying was, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. I've wasted it. What is he saying? 70 years of my life, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. And the book tells you, don't waste your life. The book tells you, don't be like that man who wasted his life. I'm going to go a little bit beyond John Piper and tell you, that man did not waste his life. I'm talking about him right now. (laughs) 
He's probably dead, and his testimony is still having fruit right now. He had no idea, however many years of his life he had left, that his testimony would be told in book form. Over a million copies, it says. People reading his testimony, you and I being blessed by it. There's not a single useless life in this room today. I don't know how the Lord will use you this week, but I believe that He can and that He will. By, as by your grace, you trust Him. Become a, become a vessel of His mercy to your parents who desperately need mercy, kindness, and patience. Be a vessel of mercy to your children who are under all kinds of peer pressure. Would you be a merciful father, a merciful mother? Would you extend God's presence? However you know King Jesus, be him, represent where you are, and display his beauty for all the world to see, because that's what his temple does. That's what his body is. And that's what you and I are.